Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Grace Community Church. I'm sorry that we are still not together, but I am hopeful that that time will be soon. Um, I've been involved over this past week in multiple conference calls with different legal groups, talking to county officials and the health department, um, talking with our insurance company, just trying to figure out what our options are moving forward. And while the bad news is that right now there is really no way for us to have an in-person group legally um, and for our insurance to still cover us um, and talking to those people and listening. And it sounds like that that time is coming sooner rather than later. Um, No one's been able to put a date on it, but it does sound like it won't be but a few more weeks, hopefully until until the tide has turned, really, and um, the law is on our side and the rights are on our side, and there are already multiple lawsuits that have been filed or are in the process of being filed that hopefully are going to change things for the better for us soon. So I am hopeful and I'm optimistic, but at the same time discouraged and saddened that um, this is where we are for now. But I did want to read a short verse here for us as we get started in worship It's Paul's prayer in Philippians, and this is my prayer as well for you guys and for us as a church body. Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And that's my prayer for us as a church in this time, that though we are apart, that we are still growing in our knowledge of Christ, that we are still growing in our love for each other and our partnership in the gospel and that through this time that God will open up doors and avenues for us to reach our community with the gospel. A few announcements as we get started. Um, Number one, just a reminder about the different opportunities we have digitally right now to get together. We have our service, obviously, and then at nine o'clock on Sunday mornings, John Henson is teaching a Sunday school class through Zoom. Um, We post all this information on Facebook. It's probably the easiest way, or you can contact me or the church office. So at 9 o'clock on Sundays, we have a Sunday school class. And then Wednesdays at 6.30, we are doing a Bible study. Uh, Brandon Hopkins and I are teaching that, mostly Brandon. And we're going through just encouragement from the Psalms, looking at a different Psalm each week and the encouragement that God brings us through that. Um, And then um, just a reminder to continue bringing your offerings at the Dropbox or you can give online. And I just, I've been so encouraged and thankful to see the diligence of our people to give, that even in the midst of this, that our giving has not dropped off. And beyond just the regular tithes and offerings, people have given above and beyond that to support mission work in India, money here to help families both in our church and families outside our church. And we've been feeding dozens of families each week, and we're starting ready to expand that with making boxes of non-perishable foods that we're going to hand out as well to families in need. So if you have some in your pantry or if you head out to the store, grab some, contact me. You can drop it off at the church, and we will start doing that. So I'm really encouraged by that. And then just, of course, the reminder that at 6.30 every night, we're asking people to take a minute to pray for the situation, to pray for our governor, to pray for our president, for our leaders, and that we'll be able to get back to worshiping soon. Let's start off in prayer, and then we'll worship the Lord together. Father God, we thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, for your love, Lord. That in difficult times, we know you're still there and we know you still love us. And we know you're still in control, Father. We ask for wisdom for our leaders, for our governor. Lord, that you would help him to see that it's time for us to um, to start opening up some things, Lord. To still be safe, to still do things we can to mitigate the risk of the spread of this virus, Lord, but most importantly, for our churches to be able to gather, Lord. I ask that you would bring that about shortly, and I ask for our leaders and all, Lord, that you would just protect them and give them wisdom, Lord, in how to lead this nation. We thank you for your love for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for that welcome, Pastor James. 
This first song is called Death Was Arrested. And in fact, the first couple of songs we're going to sing here is about God's grace. And I was listening to uh, family radio, and somebody mentioned that they had heard that the definition of grace is God's goodness at the expense of his son on the cross. And I thought that was just a great description of what God's grace means to many people. So this is a song called Death Was Arrested. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. And Nash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet my feet rose to dance when death was arrested my life began oh your grace so free washes over From my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free washes over. begins with you 
next song is an old hymn with a little twist to the melody and it's called at Calvary years I spent in vanity and pride caring not my Lord was crucified Knowing not it was for me, he died at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I'd spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. There your mercy and your grace was free. There your pardon multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Now I've given Jesus everything. Now I gladly know him as my so can only sing of Calvary yeah. there your mercy and your grace was free there your pardon multiplied to me there my burden so found liberty at Calvary there your mercy and your grace was grace that brought it down to man oh the mighty gulf that god did span at calvary there your mercy and your grace was free there your pardon multiplied to me there my burden so found to me there my burden so found liberty at Calvary at Calvary There your pardon multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. At Calvary. At this time, I'd like to share some scripture with you. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, well, who do you say, who do you say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? 
And then Peter asked, answered him, saying, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And again, that just talks about how what Jesus went through on the cross and the power that he showed in defeating death and rising three days later. The last song we're going to sing is a great song, a great hymn called How Great Thou Art.
God, we just want to thank you for the words to those songs. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for our congregation and the leadership at Grace Community Church. We just ask now that you be with our leaders, our local leaders, the leaders of the state of California, President Trump and, and his staff, and other leaders around the world who are fighting this ugly virus. And uh, you're, we just need to remember that you're in control. And uh, we just want to thank you for this time together. Thank you for our families. Thank you for the blessings that you put in our life. We ask that you continue to watch over our first responders and those in the healthcare field. They're going to work every day and putting their, li their lives at risk. And we just thank them so much. They are, the, they are definitely the heroes of this time in, in history, and uh, we can't thank them enough. So we just uh, thank you. Thank you for your, son, for your son, Jesus, as he paid the ultimate price. And in his name we pray. Amen. Planet Fitness is known as the home of the no judgment zone where supposedly you can go work out there and you don't have people judging you. And I'm thankful that the name of this church is Grace Community Church that I'm sure none of you will judge me for um, this story I'm going to tell. Because when I was in high school, I wanted to make some money and the best paying job I could find at the time that a high schooler could do that worked with my hours was telemarketing. And I was selling the New York Times. And so every day after school, I would go and I'd sit there for three hours and call and annoy people to death during their dinner time, trying to get them to buy a subscription to the New York Times. And the thing that astounded me out of all that is that this random person would call and some of them would actually give me their credit card number, not knowing who I was. I Definitely advised against doing that, but I found that I could do that, um, that some of them would give me their credit card number, of course, to subscribe them to the New York Times. And so I know someone has annoyed you with that. I know my phone now rings off the hook with those telemarketer call calls, so I, I apologize that I was one of those guilty peoples back in the late 90s doing that. But it was what I could do to make money. And I share that story because I remember my first day on the job after I had gone through the training and then it was finally time to sit at the desk with the computer and you sit there and then it just pops up. It has their name on the screen and you hear them on the line. And so you, you start going through your spiel. And of course, we had our little script. And so I'm reading through the script and then they ask a question. And it's like trying to find the question they ask because I don't know what I'm selling. I've never read the New York Times before. I'm in high school. I don't know that even now I've read the New York Times, but um, I'm trying to sell something that I don't know anything about. And over time, though, as I went through this, because it was over 100 calls a night, several hundred calls a night that I had to go through the same process. Sometimes, of course, it's a high click. Sometimes you get a little more into the spiel. Sometimes you go through it. But as I did this more often, as I talked to more people, as I got more questions, I got better and better at my sales pitch, better at, better at answering their questions, answering their objections, encouraging them to sign on for the trial for eight weeks. And I actually ended up becoming one of the top salespersons, believe it or not. I don't know how, but um, that meant I did like 0.9% of my calls turned into sales. But apparently that's pretty good in the telemarketing industry. But anyways, enough bragging about that. But the point is, is that when I started off, I didn't know what I was doing. But as I practiced, as I talked to people, I got better and better and better. And with evangelism, with reaching people, it's the same thing. We've got to practice. We've got to try. And then as we do it, each time we get better and better and better, where we don't have to read from a script and think about the training we've been through. But it just becomes a natural part of our source and a natural part of our conversation. And this is part of discipleship, is training people and then sending them out, giving them a chance to get their feet wet. So today, we are going to be looking at Jesus' first time doing this when he sends out the disciples to spread the gospel to share with people. And we're going to see that the kingdom grows despite rejection and despite some persecution, that despite all this, God's kingdom still grows. We're in Mark chapter 6 today. We're going to read through the first six verses, and then we'll go back and we'll take it apart to look at this first part. Now, if you remember, we just come off, Jesus has done four miraculous miracles, controlling nature, showing his power over demons, power over sickness, power over death. And so you would think, Jesus, now who in the world is going to not deny who Jesus is? But now chapter 6, we find Jesus goes home, and we see what happens there. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. 
And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. So we see that Jesus goes home, back to Nazareth, where he grew up, Jesus of Nazareth. He goes back home to the people that knew him, the people who had seen him grow up. And you would think coming back here, where they had seen him grow up for 30 years, I mean, this is a kid that never did anything wrong because he was sinless. He never talked back. He never said any bad words. He never got into trouble. He was always helpful, always serving, always working. The ideal kid, he comes back here doing all these miracles that they have heard of. They ask, where did this man get these things? How are mighty works done by his hands? So the people here knew who Jesus was. And so you're going to think if anybody is going to embrace Jesus, it's going to be his hometown. But we find that that's not the case. Jesus comes on the Sabbath. He teaches in the synagogue. This has his, been his usual course of action up until now. After this, he doesn't go to the synagogues anymore. From here on out throughout the book, you find him teaching in houses. But he goes into the synagogue, into the religious meeting place on the Sabbath, starts teaching, and the people reject him. Their response is astonishment that a local could teach like that. They say, this is the kid we knew. How in the world does he teach with that authority? We find that they had already made up their minds about him. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this the son of Mary? Isn't this his brothers? Isn't this his sisters? We know him. He's just an ordinary man. He's just an ordinary kid that grew up among us. And they had already made up their minds. And even miracles could not change them because they knew about his miracles. But despite that, they still could not see him as the Messiah. They were people who knew him, who did not believe that he could be anything special. They saw the kid that grew up with them, and they had trouble seeing that now he was something more. And that's something that we face as well, that we can miss people's potential, because we've known them their whole life. We've seen them grow up. We've known them for such a long time that if God does a mighty work, if something changes in their life, that we can miss that. And that was these people. They had seen Jesus for 30 years as a carpenter. Now he's a teacher, and they miss who he is. They couldn't believe he was anything special. Makes me think of Isaiah 53, verse 2, that says, When you look at Jesus, there is nothing special that you would see about him. They couldn't see him being significant again, and then they were offended by him. Verse 3, at the very end, it says, They took offense at him. And the word there for offense is scandalismo, where we get scandal. They were scandalized by Jesus. They were offended that this guy they knew would now be doing these works, claim to be the Messiah. They completely missed who Jesus was. It's not the response you would think. You would think Jesus would come home a hero, that because he came from Nazareth, they would be welcoming him in with parades and parties, and oh my goodness, our local boy has now become a national celebrity, and he's doing all these miracles, and we get to claim him as our own in Nazareth. But they reject him. They miss him. And that's where Jesus says, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town and among his relatives and in his own household. So he says, my honor is coming from elsewhere, but here at home with my own people, my own family, I have no honor at all. We see that Jesus said he could only heal a few people. Verse 5, he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And that's because he marveled there because of their unbelief. And this is not to say that that Jesus' power is tied into our faith. And so that because these people didn't believe, therefore Jesus was bound and could not do any miracles. Because Jesus, we saw last week, obviously his power is over all parts of the universe. Over nature, over death, even over the spiritual world, over demons. When Jesus by himself cast out 6,000 demons. So what does it mean that he could do no mighty work 
there. Well, Jesus' purpose for doing these miracles was not to become popular. It was not to become a magician. Jesus was not an entertainer going around healing people to try to build a big following. He was not trying to entertain people by doing these miracles. He did them so that faith would come, so that people would follow him. He did these miracles to prove to people who he was. And so when he comes to his hometown and he sees that they don't even have a clue, that they have no desire to follow him, that they've rejected him as just some ordinary human being that grew up among them, he couldn't do the miracles because he would only do miracles when the faith would follow. And when he saw that there was no potential for faith there, there was no purpose for him doing the miracles. Now, as always, there's a few that choose to follow because it said he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. So there was some level of belief there, some level of compassion that Jesus still did it. But it wasn't like he came in and the people were so welcoming of him and so embracing of him that he did all these big miracles in his hometown and multiple people from there started following him. He had a very little response. He was not just interested in social ministry, not doing the miracles just because he cared about people, but doing the miracles to produce faith. These signs were a response to faith, not bringing it about. So the first reaction of Jesus is he, he's not doing miracles there, not on a broad scale like he has been, healing people all day. The second reaction is Jesus is astounded. Jesus marvels. And this is one of only two times in the scripture that we find that Jesus marvels. And he marvels here because of the lack of faith in his hometown. And if we were to read Luke 7, 9, he marvels that he finds great faith in a Roman centurion whose servant is sick. So Jesus is amazed that at his hometown, Nazareth, where he grew up, where people knew him, if there was any people on the planet that you would think would understand who Jesus is, it would be his hometown. Because again, they'd seen him never get in trouble, never do anything wrong. They knew of his miracles. They heard his teaching. But Jesus is astounded that they don't get it. Whereas in Luke 7 verse 9, he's amazed that this Gentile Roman, who knows little about the prophecies of a Messiah, that he does get it more than even the Jews. And so we see again and again throughout this book, people's responses are so weird. The people that should get it, the religious leaders don't. People that should get it, Jesus' hometown, they don't. The disciples barely get it. But Romans get it. Gentiles, pagans get it. We'll see that at the very end of the book. The demons understand who Jesus is. And so Jesus' visit to his hometown does not go as expected. It just adds to the list, the growing list of people who miss who Jesus is. Because who's got it wrong so far? His family, they think he's crazy. His disciples think he's a good teacher and a miracle worker. But they are, were astounded last week when he was able to calm the storm. The religious leaders think Jesus serves Satan, has demonic power. The crowds think he's just a miracle worker. Herod, we're going to see here in a minute, thinks he's John the Baptist resurrected. Everyone misses who Jesus is. And we have got to make sure that we do not miss that as well. So we see denial. Jesus is denied at Nazareth. The people there deny who he is. And now we go to deployment where Jesus sends out the apostles. This starts in verse 7. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. So Jesus now says, I'm going to send out the twelve disciples. So he had a setback, in a sense, that his own town rejected him. But Jesus doesn't go home and pout. He doesn't sit there discouraged. He is always on the offense, sending people out, always sharing the good news of the gospel. So this is the first time now he sends out the 12. He sends them out in pairs, two by two, because two is better than one. They can encourage each other. He sends them out in pairs, says, go into the villages. I've given you the authority to heal. I'm giving you the authority to cast out demons. Go out and tell people to 
repent. But here's the interesting thing. These disciples, they still don't even get it. They still don't even fully understand who Jesus is. They just messed up a few chapters ago, surprised, terrified of Jesus that even the wind and the waves would obey him. And yet Jesus sends them out anyways, with the little knowledge they have to go out and call people to repent. And I share that because it's easy for us to think, I can't share the gospel. I've never been to Bible college. I don't know the whole Bible very well. I can barely spit out a verse or two. And to think there's no way that I can share what I've learned. But Jesus sent the disciples out with the little bit of knowledge and the little bit of the faith that they had. He sent them out to share the story of the gospel, to tell them about Jesus. And so in the same way, we take the knowledge that we have, we take what we know of the Bible, and we go out and we share. We share God's story of what he did through Jesus. We share our own story of what Jesus has done in our lives to change us. We go out and we can share what we know. Because what we find um, when I was in seminary, one of my professors that I really liked, one of the things he pointed out is that the typical church method in America is we lead someone to the Lord, right? And then we suck him into the church and we stick him in Bible classes for or her, we stick them in Bible classes for years and train them up and teach them and show them the Bible and tell them how to share the gospel and give them all kinds of training. And then we say, all right, now go tell your friends about Jesus. And by this time, all their non-Christian friends have left them to go on their ways. And now they're in the Christian bubble that so many of us find ourselves in. And so going out to tell their friends about Jesus is harder. And so what he proposed is when you lead someone to the Lord— Immediately make them, have them make a list of people they know who don't know Jesus. Because if they just got saved, the chances are their list of people that is unsaved is massive. And then tell them, you go tell those people what Jesus has done in your life. What you know about Jesus, go share with those people. And then you disciple that Christian. And as they come back and share, I was sharing this and someone said this, how do I answer that? You train them up and you teach them, but at the same time, you're encouraging them to continuously share as they learn and grow. And that by doing that, you can reach many more unsaved for the gospel. And this is the method that they've been using in China, that they're using in India, and the house churches are just exploding by the hundreds as people go out. As soon as they hear about Jesus, as soon as they repent and believe, they're baptized, they go out and start sharing what they know is part of their process of discipleship. And learning. And so Jesus sends the 12 out. They don't even understand everything yet, but he says, go out and tell people to repent. The supplies, he tells them, take the clothes on your back and a walking stick. <laughs> don't take anything else because he wants them to trust the Father. He wants them to know that God will provide for them. So he says, don't take a lot. Travel light. Go. When you come to a city, whoever asks you to stay there, go stay in their house. Because if this is showing them ministry is not about personal gain. He's not, don't stay at this house until a better house comes along, until a better house comes along, until a better house comes along. When you come to a place, someone says, you can stay here. Stay with them. Share the gospel with them. And this is what the missionaries are doing in China and India, and I know other nations as well. Those are just the two I'm most familiar with. Is they come in, when they come into a village, they look for the person of peace. The person who says, I am interested in hearing more about Jesus. You can host a study in my house. I'll let you stay here. And almost invariably in villages, they find that person of peace. That they can start a ministry from their house and from there branch out and reach people from the gospel. So Jesus says, this isn't about personal gain. Go stay where they offer you a place to stay. His instructions again, find a house of peace. People that reject you, you shake the dust off your feet. And for the Jews, if they were to travel to a foreign country and come back into Israel, before they crossed the border into Israel, they would shake their feet, shake the dust off their feet with just the symbolic gesture of this pagan dirt that is on my sandal. I'm going to leave it out here with the pagans so that I don't um, infect my holy land so that I can walk in purified. And so Jesus says in the same way, shake the dust off your feet as a sign to them that you are shaking it off, that they are pagans, Gentiles, 
who refuse to follow me. The message Jesus gives them, verse 12, they proclaim that people should repent. And again, that's the core message of the gospel. The core message of Jesus. That was the first words of John the Baptist in Mark 1, 4, repent. It's the first words of Jesus in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus came preaching, repent, and believe the gospel. In Acts 2, 38, when Peter gets up to preach, what does he say? All men should repent. That's the first message of the gospel, is to repent, which means to turn from living your way, to turn from doing what you want to do, and then to turn to Jesus. And so if you would, are sitting out there and you would say, you know, I don't know if I am a Christian. I've heard of Jesus. Maybe I know a little about him. I was sitting here, it popped up on my Facebook feed that a friend is watching. And so I thought I'd tune in for a little bit. But I don't know what it means to follow Jesus. Well, to follow Jesus, what the Bible tells us is that God made the world good. But then, as humans, it doesn't take um, too much to look out at the world and realize what a mess we've made of it. With all the death, all the starvation, all the hatred, all the fighting, that we've destroyed this beautiful world that God made through our sin. And because of that sin, God tells us the punishment at the end of our life when we die is not only will we perish from this earth, but we'll be separated from God forever in a place of eternal, eternal torment called hell, a place of fire. But God loves us. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. He sent his Son Jesus, who we're talking about now, to come to earth, to live on this earth, and then to die on the cross with nails in his hands and feet, crown of thorns on his head, to suffer and die, to take my punishment that I deserve of separation from God, to take your punishment that you deserve of separation from God, so that we can be forgiven. And so if we repent, meaning if instead of saying, God, I got this, I don't need you, I'm going to live life my way, if we turn from that and we turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, only you can save me. If we believe the gospel, the good news that Jesus saves us, then we can be forgiven. And rather than being on the path towards eternal torment in hell, we find ourselves on the path towards eternity with Jesus in heaven. So if that's you, please send us a message on Facebook. Please let us know that you decided to follow Christ, that you want to repent and you want to believe the gospel. Please encourage us and let us know. And we'd love to reach out and teach you more about what it means to follow Jesus. So Jesus sends the disciples out, tells them, preach the gospel. Do that. Encourage people to repent. And then they healed people and cast out demons. Well, now the story takes a dark turn. Mark, I don't know if he just is one of these ADD guys that his mind bounces all over the place because he'll talk about this story. And whoop, we'll go over here. And nope, we go back to that story. Or if he's a little more planned, I think he's a little more planned out in this. But now in the middle of this story, we're going to take a detour and talk about the demise, the death of John the Baptist. And then we'll come back and finish up this apostle story. And these two are put together kind of as a sandwich, disciples, John, disciples, to show us that A, the kingdom of God cannot be stopped by persecution. That even though John the Baptist was killed, the kingdom of God still advances. And then second to show us that it's not all roses to follow Jesus. It's not all happiness to follow Jesus. That following Jesus means sometimes there is persecution. Sometimes people are going to attack us and hate us just because we follow Jesus. So let's look at the death of John the Baptist over these next few verses. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist has risen from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had, seized, who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, 
For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his gifts, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. And so we see, the, again, people are wondering, who is Jesus? And the story of the disciples going out is heard. And it comes to Herod, and Herod finds, knows that people are, some of the people are saying that this is John the Baptist. Some people are saying it's the prophet Elijah, who Jesus is. Some people are saying that Jesus is one of the prophets of old. And we see this again in a couple chapters, in chapter 8, because Jesus asked the same question to the disciples. Who do people say that I am? And they give the same answer. Elijah, John the Baptist, one of the prophets. That was the general rumor going around Israel as to who Jesus was. But Herod knows he's beheaded John, so his theory is that Jesus is John the Baptist, come back to life. And some of this is probably because of the guilt he feels, because he knows he executed John wrongfully and probably thinks John is coming back to get him now. But we see what happens with Jesus. This is what happened with John. This is a preview of Jesus' death that both of them were executed by secular rulers who did not want them to die. They were coerced and pushed into it. Both of them executed Jesus because other people schemed behind the scenes to get them to do it. Both of them, John and Jesus, were buried by their disciples. And so we see Herod here, who doesn't want to kill John. He's afraid of John. He knows that John is a holy man. But John's problem is John stands up for the word of God. He stands up for truth and keeps proclaiming, rightfully so, that Herod, you are being immoral. You are committing adultery because Herod had married his brother's wife. He had stolen his brother's wife from him, married her. So he was committing adultery. He was living immorally. What he was doing was not right. And John would not cave to pressure John said, I'm going to preach the truth no matter what. Herod feared John. He respected him as a man of God, as a righteous man. His wife, Herodias, hated John, wanted John killed. And so she schemed a plan. So Herod's having a party, a big banquet for the nobles, the military commanders. And he asked for his, who's technically his niece, because it's his brother's daughter. I mean, when you read about Herod, his, um, his family was a complete disaster with all kinds of intermarriages and all kinds of immoral, crazy stuff. But this is probably his niece. She comes in, does a dance. The connotations of the text is this is probably not a moral dance that she is doing. And through this, Herod likes it. He says, hey, it's probably drunk. I'll give you anything up to half my kingdom. Well, for me, I'd take half the kingdom, of course. But Herodias, the wife, has such a hatred for John the Baptist that she says, this is my chance, and tells her daughter, demand John the Baptist's head. So Herod, to save face, has John executed. And so now he wonders again, is this Jesus? Is this Jesus? Is this John the Baptist who's come back to life to haunt me? He doesn't know. But despite this setback, that Jesus said that there was not a better man ever born than John the Baptist. So you got Jesus, the second best human being to ever live, John the Baptist, according to Jesus, is gone. This is not a setback. The kingdom is still advancing. And so now we get back to the story of the disciples, the debrief, when they come back and they talk to Jesus. And that's verse 30 and 31. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, 
come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. So the apostles, the 12 disciples, they come back. An apostle just means sent one, someone that is sent. And so Jesus here had sent them. They come back. The apostles, they talk to Jesus, and they start telling Jesus what they had done and what they had taught. And I can just imagine the excitement of the disciples that, you know, you got Peter there. Yes, yeah, so there was this guy came and he had this messed up hand and I said, be healed in the name of Jesus. And ma'am, he was healed. And then Thomas is like, oh man, and I did this miracle and I did this miracle. And they start talking and they're just amazed. And they come back and so they tell Jesus they're excited. All this stuff that they did, everything that they taught. And this is an important part of discipleship. You teach someone what to do. You send them out. You bring them back, and then you debrief. You have them report and evaluate. So Jesus sent the disciples out, and I'm sure they had many successes. I'm sure they had many failures. I'm sure they had many discouragement. I'm sure they came back with lots of questions. What do I do when someone says this? What do I do when this happens? How do I do this? They come back. Jesus takes the time to debrief with them, encourage them, train them, help them to do better next time. And so we see here, and then, well, the last thing that Jesus did, he says, come by to a desert place for a little bit, get some rest. These disciples were tired. They'd been traveling. They'd been out healing, casting out demons, preaching the gospel to repent and believe on Jesus. And they come back and they're tired. And of course, with Jesus, there's always people there. We're going to see that even though next week, even though Jesus gets them away here, that there's still people that come. But Jesus says, come out, rest for a minute in the middle of ministry. And it's important for us to hear that and important for us to get the balance because there's some of us that just work all the time. And every time we're at church, we're serving somewhere. And every time we're over someone's house, we're serving. We're always doing things and we're busy. Some of us struggle with the other end. They were always resting and we never serve because we did childcare like 18 years ago, that one Sunday night and we're just permanently in a state of rest. Jesus wants us to do both. He wants us to go out and serve. He wants us to go out on mission. But then he also wants us to have time of rest. And I really think that right now, this coronavirus is a good time of rest for many Christians, the faithful Christians that serve every week in church, that every time they're on campus, they're doing something, to have a time of of rest, to have a time for all of us at home where we can't go out in the evenings. There's nothing you can do to be able to have that time of rest, that time of family. But we don't rest forever. And so we get prepared and we start planning and thinking, once things go back to some sort of normal, how do I get back involved in ministry? So I want to talk about that now is by way of application. Number one, has Jesus in the church become familiar to you. I think this was the main problem of the people of Nazareth. They had known Jesus for 30 years. He had become familiar to them, and they missed who he was. Is church that way for you? Is Jesus that way for you? Christianity that way for you? Did you just go through the motions? Come sit in church on Sunday morning, go home, go to work, take the kids, come back and sit in church on Sunday morning, and go through the whole routine again. And then in light of that, my second question would be, how has the coronavirus, or COVID-19 as it's called, how has it made you rethink church and your walk with Christ? Because this virus has disrupted all of our lives, all of our routines, in good ways and in bad ways. And so how has this virus caused you to rethink the way you live your life, the way you do Christianity. And let me give you some examples here. Perhaps you see, hey, you know what? I don't know a lot of people at church. I don't feel much less connected from church than I used to because I don't know a lot of people. And so for you, you need to be involved in a group to develop those friendships, to develop those relationships. And so perhaps you would say, I recognize that once we get back to meeting, that I'm going to get involved in a small group, that I'm going to get involved in a group of people where I have that family, those relationships, because I've realized that I'm not connected as I should be. 
perhaps you realize that before this you weren't as faithful in attendance, that you only came when you could or when you felt like it. And now that you can't come, absence has made your heart grow fonder to say, I need to go more often. Or maybe you say, hey, you know what? I've kind of been in a permanent state of rest. I need to get back out there and serve. I need to volunteer for the nursery. I need to volunteer for Awana. I need to volunteer to help cook the Wednesday night meals. I need to help in VBS. I need to help in the youth group. I need to be involved in ministry. So how, as you look at your life, as it's been all shaken up, the whole world's been shaken up, what has God been showing you in your life that you need to change? Don't become like the people in Nazareth, so committed to the routine, so familiar with Jesus that you miss the bigger picture of who he is. And then finally, and most importantly, how will you be deployed on mission for Jesus? A few months ago, feels like about 12 years ago now, but I had laid out for our church a vision, that some goals that by 2025 we would accomplish some of these things. And I think this virus, though at the time we were not expecting it, I think God is going to use it to help us accomplish those goals. Because the first goal was to reach 250 people with the gospel, that each of us over five years would lead someone to Christ. And I see God tilling up the soil, giving us a culture that's scared of dying, a culture that doesn't know what happens when they die, to give us the opportunity to share with them. We talked about starting 20 new small groups. And so again, maybe you see, hey, I'm not connected. I would love to be a part of a small group. We talked about planning a couple churches, starting new works, maybe a Spanish one here in Madeira, one somewhere else in California. So I see God working there. And then finally, the last one that I really want to talk about now is praying that God would call five people in our church into full-time ministry, perhaps foreign missions, perhaps the pastor, perhaps church planting. And so... I hope as you hear that, and as you see the disciples sent out, that you actually take the time and ask God whether or not you're supposed to go. Because most people, they see themselves as their career. I could never be a missionary. But look at the disciples, the 12 disciples. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. They had different jobs. And God called them out of those careers and into ministry. So how will you be a deployment on mission for Jesus? Maybe you'll be one of those five that changes your career to be full-time ministry. Maybe when things open back up, you say, you know what? I can't go full-time, but I need to go on a mission trip. I need to, in 2021, go on a trip with the church to minister to some people overseas. Maybe you want to get involved in the food ministry. Where we're feeding dozens of families each week. I would love to help cook. I'd love to donate food. I would love to help in the community. Maybe you can hold a neighborhood cookout get to know your neighbors, share the gospel with them. All of us need to be deployed. Whether you're an Eagle Scout Christian that you know all the verses and how to share the gospel and you've been doing this for a while, whether you're a Christian that just knows that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, all of us need to be involved in mission. All of us need to be deployed. So as you look at your life, as you look at our world now, how are you on mission for Jesus. And then again, if you would say, you know what, I don't even know that I have a relationship with Jesus. I don't even know that I'm saved. I've never repented. Please make today the day that you repent, believe the gospel. Please send us a message on Facebook here. If you're on YouTube, you can email us at the church, info at gccmadera.com. Call us. Let us know. Let us know how we can serve you. Let us know what we can do for you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for these these life lessons that we see in the story of Jesus that he sent out the disciples on mission to share the gospel, Lord, and to make a difference in the world. And I pray for each of us that you would help us to be on mission, that we would not see these months of lockdown as being a time out, Lord, that yes, they are times of rest, but that we would all evaluate our priorities in life, the way we live our lives, Lord, the way we do Christianity. And then when we come back, we will come back stronger, we'll come back holier, we'll come back better in our faith than when we started, Lord. And that through the midst of this trial, Lord, the good things would come. It's in the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for tuning in again. Hopefully we won't 
have too many more weeks of this. But please again be in prayer for our leaders, prayers for them to lighten things up safely so that we can get back together corporately. God bless.